uh, thank you guys for coming out. Um, my name is Ramya, for those of you that don't know. I am the uh, program manager for the Citizen Science Program and the director of environmental science for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation. Normally, every third Thursday of the month, we have a lecture uh, for you guys about various uh, science and environmental topics. Um, this summer has been a little weird because of COVID and, and other things, but we're trying to keep up with that as much as possible, and I really appreciate you guys coming out. Um, today, uh, we have with us Leanne Frank. She is a PhD candidate at uh, Rasmus at the University of Miami, right next door. Uh, she studies uh, stressors on fish, basically, the different things that cause stress to fish, and runs a lot of really like interesting experiments with that. Uh, recently, they started a toadfish breeding program at Rasmus, and so she's gotten a chance to actually do a lot of her tests on um, larval toadfish, baby toadfish, so, which is really important because obviously when you're looking at human stressors on fish, you don't just want to look at the adults, you want to know how it's going to affect them throughout their entire life cycle because these are continuous problems that you know, humans are causing with their activity. Um, so with that, I will hand it off to Leanne to get started. Um, just a quick note, um, if you have a cell phone, just make sure that it's on silent. Um, and if you need to take a phone call, please take it out in the hallway. If you want to be signed up for our newsletter or for to be informed of future lectures, um, just let me know and I'll take your email address down and make sure you get added to our list. All right, thank you guys, and here's Leanne. Hi guys, um, my name is Leanne. I am um, in my last year of my PhD. I just started my last year. Um, I'm in Martin Grossell's lab, if you guys know him. Um, yeah, and so I study fish ecophysiology, so how climate stressors affect fish. Um, so I'll be talking about a lot of different stressors, some experiments that I did, but a lot that my lab did, or in the lab that Romeo was in before, um, that she graduated from our labs and the work that we've done, and a lot of different environmental stressors. So our lab might not look what, like, what a lot of different labs look like, uh, or what you think that you would see on TV. So we're not always in the water, unfortunately. We do sometimes go to go on boats. Here's us, someone from my lab, her name's Leela. She is a doctor now in, I think, North Carolina. Um, and she's out here catching mahi for experiments. And then this is on a ship as well, um, collecting, again, on this mahi experiments while we were exposing them to oil. And then all these rest of the ones are in our labs. So uh, in our labs, we have dry labs and wet labs. So this is right here is our wet lab. And that's where we can house all of our animals, um, all of our mostly toadfish. And we can expose them to environmental stressors at very low, safe levels in a very careful, calculated way so we can see exactly what is happening to them. Um, and then right here, this is a chamber, there, this is a density gradient chamber, and what she's doing is looking at the buoyancy of embryos. Right here, they're doing an oil exposure, and then right here, they're doing a dissection. So we mostly work in the lab, but we also sometimes get to work in the field. Those are the good days. Um, and so a good question is, why are fish so great to use to study physiology? So I fell in love with ecophysiology in my undergrad, and when I was looking at programs, most of them, other than invertebrates, um, are looking at fish. So the reason why fish are so great to use for physiology is because they evolved a very long time ago. So fish have been along, they're the oldest vertebrate and they have been around uh, for half a billion years compared to humans who just got here 0 0.0002 billion years ago. So they've been around a really long time and what that means is that they've had a long time to evolve. So they're the most diverse group of vertebrates in the world um, and with almost 34,000 species and probably many, many more that we have not found yet. Um, and so this is the big tree of it. And if you look at all these different fish, like my guys might recognize some of these, uh, anglerfish, seahorse, whale shark, um, if you guys know what that one is swordfish. So they, all of these guys have live in very different places. So an anglerfish might live down in the deep. Seahorse might live in a seagrass beds or in coral reefs. Uh, a whale shark needs to live out in the open ocean. And this guy might also live out in the open ocean, but they eat very different things. But they're all surviving all together in one body of water. And because of the way they have evolved, they can all survive and thrive in their different environments. 
And so it's really great to study physiology on a group such as the fish because we can look at different stressors, looking at different fish for different things. Some fish might be a lot better suited for warmer weather or warmer wa waters and water temperature rise than other fish. Some fish are a lot more sturdy. Um, if we were looking at schooling, we would need a fish that schools. Um, if we want to look at uh, like something that has to do with sunlight, we would never look at an angler fish because they're never exposed to sunlight. So using different species gets us a better understanding of just basic biology and how if one stressor can cause different effects on different species. Um, and also sees who's the winners and losers of different environmental stressors. Uh, another example of why we sometimes use fish to study physiology is that they can make a really good model organism to study other animals. So we produce this thing called cortisol. This is something that humans produce and also dolphins produce and is a stress hormone. It's something that we produce when we're stressed out. Um, and fish also produce this stress hormone to regulate their stress as well. But a, a mouse, something that we would normally see being studied to study human health, doesn't actually produce cortisol. It actually produces something very similar. To, it's called corticosteroid. But if you're trying to f look at stress response um, and you're wanting a model organism to do that, so maybe how a drug um, reflects this or just basic understandings of cortisol, you would rather look at a fish than a mouse. So sometimes they're just a better model organism for uh, human health as well. So there's lots of different ways that humans impact uh, animals. Do you guys want to name a couple? Some ways that humans are impacting our oceans and the fish in it? Garbage. Garbage. Plastic. Mm-hmm. Noise. Yeah, noise. Noise. I'll be talking about that one today. Overfishing. Overfishing, yeah. Drugs. Yeah, pharmaceuticals, yeah. So yeah, so we're a lot of ways we're impacting our oceans. So I know, think someone's probably said this. Global warming is a big one. The water temperatures are getting warmer. Um, also, a cause from global warming is coral bleaching, and that's a loss of habitat, as well as uh, the waters just being more acidic. Um, eutrophication, so algal blooms, which could be caused by warmer water or runoff from fertilizers. And again, pollution, large plastic pollution, but also microplastics, which is something that one of the series um, in April talked about. We talked about microplastics. Uh, pharmaceutical pollution, a lot of us are on some type of prescription medication, and a lot of us are on the exact same prescription medication. So that is getting into our waters. Noise pollution, which is something I'll be talking about. Most people live by the water, so there's uh, a lot of noise pollution. Um, and then there's big catastrophic events like this is from the Gulf Horizon oil spill. So there's a lot of different ways, and there's even more than what I named, in which we are affecting uh, our oceans and the fish that live in them. So my lab's approach to studying multiple stressors, since the ocean has no walls is that and no borders, is that these fish are often being exposed to more than one stressor at once. So when you want to study multiple stressors, um, you have to look at different, to get a better understanding of how this is affecting the animals, is this working? Um, is to look at multiple stressors and looking at multiple levels of the biological scale. So if you're looking at the molecular scale and you're looking at a stressor, you know exactly what is happening to that gene or that molecule and how it is being affected by the stressor, but you're not, you have a less a better idea of how it's affecting the whole organism or maybe the species or the population as a whole. Um, but you have exact idea what the, what the stressor is doing. And then as you get up, you get a better idea of how it's affecting the whole animal or the whole population, but you have less of an idea of what the exact cause of it. So if you're just looking at the population and you see the population's declining, there could be many, many reasons why that is happening. So our approach is to look at multiple levels to see exactly what is causing these uh, population effects, or if you see a molecular effect, how that is going down the chain, the biological level. So an example, sometimes this doesn't work, of this is the Gulf Horizon oil spill. So this was our largest oil spill in history. I'm sure you guys remember, I usually teach children and they, none of them are alive. <laughs> so, um, so about five million gallons of oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico and two to five trillion fish died, which is just 
an, a, a large amount, like it's not a number that we can even fathom, that's how many fish died. And that's just how many fish died, but there were a lot more animals affected by this. So going back to this hormone that I was talking about, cortisol, um, I'll show one example of, again, why we use fish. So uh, cortisol, again, is, a main, is our, one of our main stress hormones, and we produce it and fish produce it, and it tells us, gives us an adrenaline rush, tells us something is wrong, and then it leads to our survival. So we get stressed out, and then we figure out, okay, I need to escape the predator. I need to, like, cram for my exam. I need to do something about this. That leads to survival. Or maybe it's like, maybe I need to go on a vacation and get away from work. Yeah, that's survival for a lot of us. Um, and so one of the first things that happened during the Gulf Horizon oil spill, not our lab, not somebody from the Rosenthal School, but another lab, I think in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, looked at wild dolphins exposed to this oil. And they went and they caught dolphins and they took a blood sample. And they saw that they had low cortisol levels. So why would that be a bad thing? It would be bad that they had a low cortisol level. Yeah, yeah, and these guys are just being caught from ships or like from a boat off the side with a net, corralled, taking a blood sample. And so they had a low cortisol level where they should have had a very high one. And so, yeah, they're going to go closer to boats, act dangerously, maybe go towards predators, not escape as well, maybe not catch their prey as well. And t what uh, the Danielle McDonald's lab looked at is to see, um, to look at toadfish. So we know toad toadfish also have this cortisol. Do they have the same response? And so we use toadfish as a model to look at this, expose them to small amounts of oil. All of the oil that we used for our studies came from the oil spill. So we had well oil that was um, you know, not uh, polluted with ocean water. And then we also had uh, water that came up from the surface. So we have the exact same oil type for these, all these studies, and we see when they're exposed to oil that we do see, again, this decrease in cortisol levels. My lab, um, this is right before I started, that's our main, our main funding was to study the Gulf Horizon oil spill. It's part of Recover. It's a project consortium of a bunch of different universities to study the effects of the oil spill on fish. Now they're on um, a different consortium about helping the Gulf recover less more about information and how much harm that it caused and now how do we recover this. But we wanted to study um, the, the oil spill and the effects it had on this, these fish. So we looked again at different life stages. We looked at embryos. We looked at, let's see if I can get this to work. It's not working. Uh, we, we looked at embryos. We looked at larval fish and we looked at adults. And then we looked at um, whole organisms and respirometry, as well as looking at different organs. Um, so you used a couple different study organisms. Here we go. Uh, first, our main two were the mahi-mahi and the red drum. So here at Rasmus, at the Rosenthal School, we looked at mahi. And then in Texas, I think the University of North Texas is looking at the red drum. The reason why we chose these two fish is because they have very different life histories. The mahi is a big pelagic fish in the open ocean. I'm sure you guys have either seen it, eaten it. Um, they're very good athletes. They can swim very far, go very far, big athletes. They were in the middle of their spawning season and in the spawning habitat when the Gulf Horizon oil spill happened. So these guys might have been exposed to high dosages, but they could have gotten away if they were able to and their early life stages were probably also exposed to this. So that's why we use these guys. The red drum is, lives closer to the coast. It's a coastal fish, um, not as good of an athlete, still good to eat, but less of an athlete. And so they're going to be further away from the spill, but being exposed con consistently maybe to smaller amounts. So we wanted to look at two different life species to see how they're affected. We also wanted, to, we used a couple of other fish to study different things. This guy is the damselfish, also lives in the Gulf um, around coral reefs. Uh, we use them because they're really good for behavior. They stay in one spot. They have a little nest that they're very protective of. And they also have a very good sense of smell. So if we wanted to look at how oil is affecting their sense of smell, we would use these guys. And then another species that we looked at is the toadfish. Toadfish is just good to study because uh, they're the most, one of the most durable species that we 
can study. That's why it's the main species of Danielle McDonald's and Martin Grossell's lab, is because they can be, we can take them out of water and do like surgeries on them without flushing their gills. They can be exposed to super hot water, super cold water, hyper saline. They're just very sturdy. So if something is affecting them, that's uh, one, not a good sign, and two, when you're looking at experiments in stress, if all your fish die, you don't get any information from that, right? So we want fish, our fish to either survive the exposures to be able to do these studies. Okay, so looking at the impacts. So first, we're looking at trying to find if there's any genetic defects from this oil. So we expose them to, fit, uh, to this oil, we exposed embryos, and when they hatched. So which fish do you think is ex was exposed to the oil, the top or the bottom one? Yeah, so one sign is like seed their plant. Is it looking? That's okay. Okay, so look at the top spine, the spine on the top one, and look at the spine on the bottom one. Just like humans, we don't want a curvy spine on our fish anyways. Um, and then also, if you look at the yolk sac right by the heart, it has a cardiac edema. Um, you can just also see that it's the yolk all around it is not really covering it. So this one on the bottom, probably not going to make it. Um, next, we wanted to look at their vision. So we can't do a seeing eye test for fish. We can't tell them to read a line, but we can test their vision. So how we do that is this is like a little circular pool and it spins and it has black and white and schooling fish will tend to stay with one color, one section and follow it around as long as they're healthy. But when we expose them to oil, they just kind of randomly, they lose track of it consistently. And that would be equivalent to them losing track of maybe their school or losing track of their prey. So we see that there are some vision effects as well. Next, we wanted to look at, we don't know if this is neurological or if it's in their nose, but we wanted to look at food response. So we exposed them to a food cue or a predator cue. So a food cue, this is when we use the damselfish. A food cue would be something like brine shrimp, something they eat. And like it's the essence of that in the water and they have a, a tank that goes like this, it's like a T and they can choose which side. And we do it with one side with a food cue, one with nothing, or we'll do a predator cue and a food cue, or a predator cue and nothing. Um, and when it's a healthy fish, they're going to almost always choose, almost always, fish aren't perfect, the food cue over the predator cue or over nothing. But when we expose these guys to oil, that they were just randomly, almost 50-50, choosing a cue, food or predator. So we see that the oil is also affecting their ability to maybe smell or decision making. We're not exactly sure. Um, I know they did further experiments from there, but I don't think the results are out yet. Uh, next, we looked at their heart. So this is a cardiomyocyte. That is a heart cell. Um, we take the hearts out of their bodies while they're still pumping, and we can measure their heart rate. And when we do that, we see that this is control, and this is exposed to oil. And if you see that this is just a little bit shorter, so that means their heart is not beating as strongly or as deeply. So that's less blood being pumped, which is very important if it's a fish like the mahi, which is basically running a marathon every single day of its life. So very important. Um, next, we wanted to go up a little bit higher. Now we're looking at the full organism, and we're looking at their swimming. So this is a swim tunnel respirometer. It is basically like if you've ever had a stress test, and that is like a mask while you run on a treadmill. Basically, it's the same thing, but for fish. So they're in a tank that is covered, and it's oxygenated, but it closes and opens to measure their oxygen consumption. And we can set the speed of the, the swim tunnel. So it's like pushing water, and they have to maintain swimming. And so when we expose them to oil, that we see that they cannot swim as fast or as far when exposed to oil. So we take all of these little experiments that are very much so in a lab, controlled, and we want to see if there's any effects when they're actually out in the wa water. So what happened was, in our lab, the person that I saw fishing earlier, Leela Schlenker, she went out. We have mahi that breed at um, the Rosenthal School at the aquaculture. We have mahi that are 
in-house that we can breed. They went and uh, tagged them in-house, and from there we measured their behaviors and could model like spawning behavior by the tags, movement, speed, um, and stuff like that, make sure they worked. Then we went out onto the boat, caught 50, 100 fish, 50 were exposed to oil and 50 were not, caught them, recovered overnight in a pool that was either exposed to little bits of small amounts, relevant amount of oil or just water, and then re released them to track their migration, spawning behavior, if they were caught by a predator. So it's really cool, I think, when you see if they're caught by, so maybe the tag went really deep, but it stayed really warm. Obviously, it was caught by a marine mammal. A whale must have gotten that fish. Um, if it went really deep, but it's really cold, could have been maybe a shark or something. Um, so we can see by what, not exact science, but we can see by the tax behavior what is happening to these fish. Uh, those results, I think, either just came out or haven't come out yet, so we're still excited to see that, uh, those results. Okay, so that was from the oil spill. Now I'm just going to talk about a couple more um, types of pollution. So pharmaceutical pollution, which Ramya knows a lot more about than I do, um, this is caused because, just like in Finding Nemo, all drains lead to the ocean. Um, so if we do have sewage treatment, but there is still trace amounts of pharmaceuticals in our wastewater, especially near wastewater treatment facilities where this water is coming out. And how a medicine might affect us as humans is not exactly how it might affect a fish. It can affect their reproduction, it can affect their sex, can change their genders. Um, it can affect a lot of different behaviors, um, eating, reproduction, anything like that. Um, so it's really important that we take care of our, pharma our pharmaceuticals and we don't flush them down the drain. You see it all the time in movies where they pour all the pills down the sink or down the toilet. We should not be doing that. We should be getting rid of it at, you can get rid of it at your pharmacy usually. Um, and this is another way that a different types of pollution can affect is chemical communication. So just like dogs or actually freshwater fish, crustaceans and other animals uh, and marine mammals use pheromones in their urine to communicate. They may be communicating to each other uh, to say like, hey, I own this place. Or they may be communicating to find a mate. But they use their pheromones in their urine um, to communicate. Um, and human impacts can make it hard for these fish to smell pheromones and find mates. So there are different ways it can affect some are like pollutants. Like I said, in the oil spill, this can cause a effect. And another way is ocean acidification. And here is a video. I might have to start it myself. Yep. OK, so here's a video of two fish. There's a black fish that has a black dot and a white fish that has a white dot. Um, toadfish are very territorial. So what they're doing right now is fighting. They use, it's called mouth fighting. They bite each other's heads um, to maintain dominance. So they're right now trying to figure out who wants the tube. And they're fighting right now. And it looks like the black fish won, right? And then, so we, this is when they have been exposed to oil and they lose their sense of smell. I think it was oil that they were exposed to. And then this is the next night. So normally, they wouldn't be fighting again. They've already figured out who maintained dominance. But here they are fighting again. And this time, the white fish won. So if they uh, cannot smell each other, they just consistently just keep fighting back and forth. So it can lead to a lot more uh, behavioral changes and aggression. Um, another type of pollution that somebody said uh, is noise, noise pollution. So again, most of us live by the ocean. Most of, Amer most of people in the world live by the ocean. Um, and so there's a lot of different types of noise pollution, like from boats, uh, from pile driving, sonar, and seismic surveys are just a couple. Um, and one way that we can study uh, noise pollution, we use these toadfish. They use noises to uh, find their mates and to maintain dominance. They're very territorial. 
And so one way we can expose them to see if noise pollution affects them is by in a pool right here is a speaker, an underwater speaker and an underwater mic. So what's happening right here is that we can play noises. So their main predator would be the dolphin. Um, we could play dolphin noises and see how often they are coming out of their nests or maybe boat noises, different types of noise pollution to see if this is stressing them out or changing their behavior. So that's that sound. It's, okay, I might have to turn that off. No, it's okay. I think they. <laughs> okay, so so that guy was a little gulf toadfish. Uh, Mike Schmally, uh, who lives on the key with Lynn Fieber, he took this video right on Key Biscayne. This is a male toadfish who is calling. He might be calling to a mate. He might be calling to warn people of that's his nest. Um, but this is called a boat whistle call, and this is what they use, especially during mating season. So if you're ever snorkeling, they live really shallow. You could hear this, like, sounds like your phone's almost going off. If you hear that in the water, that is probably a toadfish trying to call out for a mate. When these fish, when we play these dolphin noises, um, again, dolphin, dolphins are their main predator, or the, one of the main food groups of dolph the bottlenose dolphin. And dolphins use sonar. So when they hear dolphin noises, they stop making noises. But we also found that they also, when you play boat noises, they also stop making noises. So noise pollution, so heavy boat traffic, could be an effect of uh, lower toad fish reproduction. So another way we list, we've um, studied this noise pollution was a couple years ago. There, I hope probably all of you guys remember this. It was a big pain in everyone's butts. Um, there was a very big music festival right on Virginia Key, Ultra, which is an EDM, very like very loud music festival and very huge, like 50,000 people music festival. Um, and luckily, through the Key Biscayne Foundation, we got um, our lab, uh, Danielle's lab, and a couple other labs got to study the effects of. We looked at fish. Some people looked at bird migration, and some people looked at shark migration to see if there was an effect of this noise pollution of the one big event for four days of noise pollution. So right here is the, my, the school. Here's Rosenthal School. Here's our aquaculture facility. This is where we keep all of our fish. Um, we actually do notice that they are stressed every time that there is a music festival across the street. Um, we notice it almost every single time we can see like higher stress rates, you can see the fish flipping out. Um, and so we put kitty pools right there to measure their cortisol levels. We put kitty pools right at the end of the aquaculture facility, and then the music festival was right there. So basically only separated by a fence. And we looked at cortisol levels. So back to the stress hormone. So we looked at three weeks before the music festival, four days, and then during the music festival. And there was a very significant increase in cortisol levels. So even music can stress out these fish. And so luckily, we don't have to ha deal with this. At least Ultra, there's still other music festivals. But at least Ultra should not be coming back here. Because uh, again, music is a, a noise pollution does cause stress in these animals. OK, lastly, I just want to talk about climate change. So this is mostly what I study. I look at different climate stressors. So I look at warmer waters, uh, hypoxia, which is low oxygen. Um, and then I also look at the hypersalinity, so salty water. Um, and climate change is caused by increased CO2 in our atmosphere. Um, it can be caused by deforestation, our cars, factories. Most of it is caused through industry, not personal use, but, um, and uh, they release CO2 and other gas uh, trapping gases, heat trapping gases, like methane is another one, for example, um, into our atmosphere. Luckily, we have the ocean. The ocean is a huge buffer. It is buffering and absorbing a lot of this heat and a lot of our CO2. 
but buffers aren't perfect and limitless. And so uh, when it's reaching its limits, we do see these effects. We see the waters getting warmer, less oxygen, and more acidic. And this is causing lots of different problems. And this is what uh, most, a lot of our school studies with the corals or the fish, sharks, uh, seagrass, we all started or looking at this warmer water, this low oxygen environment, and it's getting more acidic. So it's causing sea level rise. For the corals, it's causing bleaching, um, causing to toxic algal blooms, uh, loss of habitat, acidification. And again, this is causing larger effects into our fisheries. Okay. And the habitat most at risk from climate change, do you guys know this one? Yeah, our, our habitat, coral reefs. Coral reefs are the most uh, at risk. So these fish and corals, are they have to live in a very specific environment. They need enough sunshine to live and warmer, warm water, but not too warm water. And uh, corals can't really migrate. They have such a, a small limit of where the habitat that they can live in. So our habitat right here in our backyards is the most at risk from this climate change. Um, going into a little bit more of the specifics, acidification, uh, usually when we think about ocean acidification, we think about the corals because they are made out of calcium carbonate, so having increased CO2 greatly affects them by dissolving them and making them weaker. Um, fish are pretty resilient to CO2 just survival studies, so if you're just looking at mortality, you're not going to really see an effect for most fish are going to be able to cope with it. But we do see some studies, this is a little bit more, depends on the species type of thing. There's a lot more winners and losers for CO2. Um, and so we see that they can become smaller. Um, so just like we have to buffer our blood, fish have to buffer their blood. You, we can't get our blood more acidic or more basic, otherwise we get very sick. Same thing with fish. Um, but they live in their environment. They're uh, surrounded by it. So they, if it's, they're spending more energy just maintaining their blood balance, their blood uh, pH, that could become at a cost. Um, another effect, a lot of these effects are neurological. So sc schooling fish, like fish, just like us, we are left-handed or right-handed. A lot of schooling fish are left-minded or right-minded. So if you chase a uh, school, they will all turn one way or they all turn another. And they're not talking to each other. They have it like built within them, within that school, to know which way to go. Um, when you expose them to CO2, we see that they lose this and they just basically randomly choose left or right. That's going to cause a problem uh, when there's a predator and they lose their school. They're more likely to be isolated. Um, another thing, looking at these damselfish, so we, again, these damselfish live in coral reefs and they kind of just stay put. Um, they are very small, so everything wants to eat them. And so they don't tend to go out at night. Uh, they tend to be very safe in their little environment, only sneaking in and out. Um, though, when we expose them to CO2, we expose them to, took them into a lab, expose them to CO2, put them back in their habitats. The ones exposed to CO2 were all gone the next morning. Um, this is because they just have left. They probably got eaten because um, it's causing them to have le reckless behavior. And then again, same thing with the oil. We see this impaired smell. So we see they lose this uh, ability to sense a predator cue from a food cue. They're just randomly choosing. So while it's less about overall mortality just by being exposed, it's more like smaller effects. Um, hypoxia, which is low oxygen. Um, that causes, just like we need oxygen, fish need oxygen, so when they're exposed to uh, hypoxia, it's kind of like when we're up in really high latitudes. There's just less oxygen to breathe. That's going to cause them to have reduced swimming and foraging abilities. Um, more predation if there is a fish that can move very high depths up and down into it. Um, reduced habitat, so there's less places for them to live. Um, and then increased, um, I'm not sure what that one says, uh, decreased reproduction. They're putting less energy into that because they're having less oxygen just to live and survive. And again, can cause big mortality events if it's too prolonged. Um, increased temperature can also, is causing a lot of our fish to move. So they are moving deeper or they're moving 
north to the poles, either pole, um, and or both. So Atlantic cod is um, moving, and then another species, for example, is black sea bass. And so when these guys are moving, there's just less habitat for them. It's causing a lot of overfishing because then the in certain areas, they look like there's a lot of them. In certain areas, it looks like less, but because there's overall less habitat. Um, it can also cause size differences. This one's a little bit, again, winners and losers. Some get bigger and some get smaller. So if they're already um, at their peak of their aerobic scope, they're going to get smaller because everything else is just, everything else is ramping up. These guys are cold-blooded or ectotherms. So their basic metabolic rate is going to be increased. For a lot of fish, this is causing them to get smaller. And again, this comes to a head. Uh, this is a lot of what I'm studying is this fish kill or the fish kills that are happening in Biscayne Bay. Um, so I study toadfish. Toad, this one in 2020 was one of the biggest ones, but there has been at least one every year since and before. Um, but 2020 was very large fish kill. And um, they said it was due to pollution and warm temperatures uh, and low dissolved oxygen. And the main fish that was affected by this, 42 percent, 40 something percent of the fish were toadfish. This fish that we know is very resilient to most stressors, including hypoxia. We know that they're very hypoxia tolerant. So a lot of what I'm studying is why. And this happened in August. Their spawning season is about from March, April to like June, July. So this is when there are young larval and juvenile toadfish out. So that's not going to come up again in these fish counts. In these fish kill counts, it's only the adults. And only things that are really floating to the top. So anything sinking down isn't getting measured. And all the small larval and juvenile fish aren't getting measured. So what I study is looking at larval and juvenile fish and looking at their hypoxia tolerance and just seeing how uh, sensitive they are to it to get a better understanding of these fish kills, how really they are affecting our environment in Biscayne Bay, and looking at the cause of it. Um, so I didn't want to leave you guys on a very sad note. Um, I just wanted to shout out some local organizations. Uh, we're not helpless. We're not doing nothing. A lot of, there's a lot of great people in Miami, uh, Key Biscayne Foundation included, that are doing a lot of work to help save Biscayne Bay and save Florida, trying to restore our coral reefs to reduce pollution. Um, here's just, just a couple. Uh, fill a bag, which you guys all know from Key Biscayne, is helping with a lot of beach cleanups, debris-free oceans, which focuses on reducing plastics and reducing our footprint um, free plastic, which um, uses plastic pollution to make beautiful art. Uh, zero waste culture looks, again, at looking at reducing our carbon footprint, consumerism, trying to be more sustainable. Uh, Soflora Moras is a research organization founded by Rasmus alum, um, and they do a lot of the sea turtle counts. They retain, try to retain our local marine ecologists and use them throughout the Florida, or throughout Miami, working on sustainability and research. Um, and then lastly, Miami Waterkeeper, which is doing a huge job on our watershed, studying the effects of that, looking at these fish kills, looking at water quality, sewage leakages, um, looking at lobbying for good law, like better laws and better quality control. So all of these organizations, and there's a lot more that I didn't name, um, are doing a really great job and doing trying to work their best to uh, help save and keep Miami beautiful. Um, another couple of other things, if you just want to do some actions, um, there's corporateaccountability.org, which is um, it's a tool to help run visibility action in your community to promote tap water over bottle water. Um, another one is Miami Surf Rider, which looks at protecting our ocean and waterways. Um, they do anything from like beach cleanups, um, looking at keeping plastic out. And then uh, another website that you could use to look at some different action items is Smog of the Sea. Uh, this is a documentary about microplastics in our oceans. 
Um, you can watch it for free through the website. And then they also have a Take Action tab, which has dozens of different items to help uh, if you want to do anything from signing petitions to learning about being more uh, sustainable. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, um, so I don't know exactly. I know, obviously, there's noise pollution and light pollution. Um, turtles are probably being affected by the 4th of July, I could assume. She knows a lot more about turtles than I do. Um, so, and then also, there's just like smog, there's stuff falling into the water, pollution. So, I'm sure if we measured their cortisol levels before and after the 4th of July, they would be stressed out. I'm sure it causes a lot of fish to migrate away from the coast. Um, luckily, this year was the first in Miami to have a drone light show, which is a different way of having a soundless and uh, no pollution way of having fireworks. So I think that's really cool that we're trying to figure out different ways to still celebrate. Yeah, yeah. To the right or to the left, yeah. Which increases water. their likelihood to get predated right. or just it's not make extra it. Stress and extra energy that yeah. they're, they're expending. So it just kind of depends on where they are exactly and where the fireworks are happening in relation to them. Thank you so much for sharing those tidbits. Um, so I have a couple questions about the cortisol um, and the link with the oil. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I mean, do they know precisely what the mechanism is? Is it an endocrine disruptor? Is it a neurological? Um, yeah, I'm not sure thing? exactly. I think it is an endocrine disruptor. Um, the makeup of oil is, this is not my area of expertise, so I'm not exactly sure, um, but I'm pretty sure it is an endocrine disruptor in, for oil, but I would have to look more into that, I'm not exactly sure. And then do they know how long the effect persists? I mean, is this something that is managed over time, or is it once it happens, it just sounds like this? Um, I'm not sure they have done any studies on that, on different on survivability, or like cortisol levels throughout time. I think it does get better, but I, I couldn't, I would have to read the paper again, I'm not sure. But, but each one of the effects that they saw were, I mean, she was showing the marbled fish and how, like, you know, there's, like, clear, you know, yes. physical problems with them developing, but there are also, like, genetic mutations that are occurring because yes. of the oil that they encounter as they're developing, and then those genetic mutations are passed on through generations. Yeah, so swimming ability is reduced. I know they've done that one in adults 
for larval and juvenile fish that were exposed, they're still having effects later on in life uh, with their ability to swim. And I think they also have heart defects very often. Um, and sometimes the neurological things, I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure exactly on that one, but I do know that they're being exposed to oil at younger life stages does have effects later down on the line. Same with pharmaceuticals. If you have pharmaceutical pollution at early life stages, that can cause large reproduction effects down the line as well. Specifically, that's the one I know the most about. <laughs> Um, by oil, um, for mahi, no, because any mahi, mahi only live to be about five, so you have not eaten an oily mahi because they are long gone, they have lived their life. They only really lived about three in the wild. Um, with other fish, I'm not sure. Um, with like larger fish like tuna that can live a very long time, I do, though, do know that they do have bioaccumulation of other toxins like heavy metals. So I wouldn't be surprised if oil toxins are also be in there. Is your lab also doing work on um, sunscreen toxicity and the components that are you know, causing the coral reef die offs and the effects on fish? We aren't. Uh, we don't study that. Um, I don't think anyone at our school studies that. I used to work at Moat Marine Lab and they are studying that because I used to work in a, a biochemistry lab there looking at that in the bio accumulation of shellfish um, as well as just like in the water levels. So I know people are working on that, just not our school. Um, we can't really affect the temperature. I mean, maybe we can, but that's a, a bigger challenge. But what, would you guys speak to us the, the one solution or the one thing we can do? Is it just the pollution? What, what um, do you see? Is it well, we on? can't stop climate change, basically, oh, it's too late, but we can mediate the effects. We can slow the progression of how fast we're going. The main thing is, honestly, it's not on the individual, it is on society as a whole, industry, it's, um, you know, uh, water quality dumping is a huge one, and then, like, just industry, CO2 levels, carbon, like, how much carbon they're producing in their carbon footprints, reducing that, changing the way, lobbying, is honestly the biggest way that we're making these changes. Um, for the coral reefs, we are doing a lot of work on restoration, trying to figure out which species, uh, which algae that live inside of it are the strongest. So looking at different ways of restoring um, our environments, we are currently working on that in the all over Florida. There, there seems to be uh, very little um, I mean, uh, I don't know if it's a budget issue, but enforcement on this same day of, um, you know, dumping, fishing, boating. Um, yeah, um, there are people caring about that. I think there was a meeting today or yesterday about from uh, that Miami Waterkeeper was talking about, talking to the City of Miami Council, looking at water quality conditions, trying to make it stricter, trying to make it more realistic, um, but also making sure they're meeting it, because a lot of times they aren't meeting our water quality, um, reducing sewage leakage. Yeah, that is just um, government and trying to make sure that we make our voices heard and that we care. And there are a lot of really good people, specifically the Miami Waterkeeper, that are trying really hard to um, figure out the con uh, stricter restrictions that are more feasible and trying to make those uh, realistic, yeah. I mean, for the funding is definitely an issue. Yes. Um, they are stretched really thin, trying to enforce a lot of these um, uh, standards um, and laws, but also um, priorities. You know, like, there are certain things that they will absolutely enforce a lot harder than, you know, like, water quality standards, you know, like, overfishing or fishing out of season, you know, things like that is a much higher priority to enforce for them uh, because that affects tourism a lot more or, you know, the sort of the bottom line, you know, like where, where are we making the most money? That's what's most important. You know, tourists don't come here and care about water quality. They care that they can come here and go fishing or, you know, sit on the beach and enjoy themselves or whatever. So there's certain areas that are just, you know, like prioritized over others. And then on top of that, you know, there are budgetary issues and the, you know, enforcement is stretched really thin in general. 
So that, that makes it a lot harder. Yeah. And then, you know, things like water quality standards are really hard to enforce because there's, you know, a lot of testing that needs to be done. It's expensive, um, you know, taking water samples and getting them tested in the lab costs a lot of money. And um, fixing the issue also and takes fixing a the issues money. are really expensive, yeah. Um, they do, I mean, there are things that they have to do. There's a consent decree with the federal government where uh, the, uh, I think it was the, no, it was the state of Florida, I think, or maybe it was Miami County, I don't remember. Um, but basically they were just like, you know, the federal government was like, your sewage system is trash and you need to fix it um, and like really do something about it. And so they have this consent decree with, with the federal government where basically like, you have, we're giving you this much money, like some amount in billions, I don't remember, to fix your, your sewage system. And so that's what that money is supposed to be used for. And I think it was um, 2019 that somebody, um, a citizen reported seeing a leak from one of the um, outflow uh, pipes from one of the wastewater treatment plants that was just pumping, you know, a partially treated sewage um, into, or wastewater, but that's the same thing, um, into the water. And it's supposed to be pumped three miles offshore, and it's supposed to be fully treated by then, because apparently somehow it gets treated in the tube. I don't really know how that works. Um, but it was like barely a mile offshore. It was like 0.8 miles offshore. And it was just leaking right into the water column. And they reported it, and then also uh, reported it to Miami Waterkeeper, who then went out and checked it out. They got video of it, saw it, and um, did a FOIA request with uh, the county, and found that they had known about that leak for a year. And they hadn't done anything. And, and within the emails that they saw, they knew about it. It was like they found out about it before. And the emails were like, well, where do we get the money to, to fix something like this? And so immediately, Miami Waterkeeper filed a, an, an intent to sue. Because they're like, you literally have money specifically for this. That's what the consent decree was for. And then they fixed it in a week. You know. So I mean, a lot of it is just like, Either like the people, you know, and I'm not saying that they're all like terrible people and don't care, you know, but like there does seem to be some like miscommunications or disconnect between like what the their funds are for and what needs to be done and how that needs to get done and you know have properly allocating like their their personnel and their their money. But aren't there milestones that they have to to attain at certain time to move the consent decree and then I mean, lift? I believe so. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure how well they've been attaining those milestones. Um, I, I've only glanced at the consent decree is quite long, <laughs> so I haven't read the whole thing. I, but, I would, yeah. but yeah, there are milestones with that. I would think it would be in the interest of the village of Key Biscayne or our locally elected government officials to be on top of that. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, I mean, it's, it's you know, in everyone's best interest to, to be on top of things like that. You don't want to be swimming in water that has like sewage leaks into it. That's so. Well, also, I mean, we've worked a lot with Miami Waterkeepers. They're the ones that have brought forth the fertilizer ordinance, and um, they do water testing. Um, and they do water testing. Yeah. Yeah. No. And enforcement. And they and steel. Yes, they do that for Virginia Key, too. Enforcement yeah. and private property. They're going to hold the fertilizer ordinances, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's stuff of a lot of education materials. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things they're working on now is uh, trying to convince everybody to get off of septic. Theoretically, it's better, but also extremely expensive, so it's hard for local officials to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I mean, there, there's a lot of yeah enforcement, like I said, for private. Plus, they have to have the capacity in their sewage system to absorb all these people that are sitting on septic tanks, and I don't think they do. Oh, I don't think they do. 